Hey everyone, it's Tim from Linus Farm Specialty and Heirloom Livestock. Thanks for joining us again today. So today we are traveling to southern Indiana. We're actually going to Madison, Indiana. We are going to be interviewing Lee and Lauren Nicholson at Nicholson Farms. So they kind of run a hybrid operation, very similar to some of the videos you may have seen online from the likes of Greg Judy when it comes to rotational grazing. And they also institute some other useful tips and tricks including feeding a little bit of grain, a little bit of some other things that we are going to cover, and some free choice mineral. They raise primarily hair sheep, but they do have a strong history in raising goats and cattle as well. Technically, we're looking at about 200 head of sheep on a little over 100 acres of land. Really looking forward to this interview. Without further delay, let's see what's going on at Nicholson Farms. Hey everyone, it's Tim from Lanasa Farm Specialty and Heirloom Livestock. Thanks for joining me today. So today we are here with Lee Nicholson and we are in Madison, Indiana, yes? Yes, that's correct. All right, so tell our viewers a little bit about the farm and tell us a little bit, I guess the best place to start is tell us a little bit about where we're located in the grand scheme of the United States because you're actually closer to Kentucky. I'm close. I'm real close to Michigan. You're real close to Kentucky. Yes. How far are you from Kentucky? Uh, literally less than 10 miles. Okay, wow. So, Closer than I even thought. Yes. Yeah, we're right on the Ohio River. Uh, Jefferson County, Indiana. It's a real small historical town here. So yeah. tell, me about, tell me about the farm itself. How, how big is the farm? So there's 140 acres on the total site. Um, we only have 100 acres under fence. The rest is in... Uh, where the, where the house is, and then of course uh, some of the classified forest programs, things like that. Okay. Uh, and we've got about uh, 17 different paddocks. Okay. Uh, so sliced up inside of that. Um, they vary, those paddocks vary in size anywhere from three to eight acres. Um, so it kind of varies across the board depending on, on the application that we're trying to get accomplished. Do you have a favorite size now that you're look? I guess that would be a, a question I'm interested in is now that it's divided up, do you wish you would have did it differently? Or are you pretty happy with the way it, it turned out? So I like how it turned out. Um, you know, me kind of being the overthinker, I overanalyzed everything. And, um, you know, based upon the calculations uh, on grass production and things like that, really to me the magical number was like right around six to seven acres based upon my schedule. Everybody's schedule is different. Um, you know, a lot of us work full-time jobs and then we, you know, the, the farm is the side hustle. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when I was first starting out, I only wanted to, to rotate once a week on the weekends, you know. Um, it kind of helped with the worm population, everything else. But it also, if at a max capacity, um, you know, you could adjust your time frames pretty easy, all centered around that six to seven acres per paddock. Sure. So you're, you're running, let me back up, because I know you originally started with goats. Yes. So when you did all these calculations, were you figuring the, everything for goats and then you, you morphed into sheep? Uh, which we already talked about, that you changing over into sheep. Uh, but the initial plan, was that for goats? So the the calculations I used could work for goats for any livestock. Okay. Because, um, you know, at the same time that I had, had the goats, I also had the cows uh, as well. Um, you know, and I utilized those cows for the parasites to help clean them up, you know, so I'd rotate the cows behind the goats. Um, to, to help clean those parasites explain, as we went along. Explain that to viewers. What what do the cows do? How do they help? So in the situation that I was running, um, so uh, the barber pole worm is your worst enemy when it comes to small ruminant animals, sheep and goats. So um, the goats are a lot more susceptible, in my opinion, than the sheep are to those barber pole worms. Um, and at the peak production of, of a female barber pole worm, um, you know, they're laying 10,000 eggs a day. Sure. So if you have that situation in a very worst case scenario with 100 animals in six acres, that's a big worm load. Um, so 
if you run your forage calculations, you know, so that I would run about 250 pounds per acre foot, you know, that's on the low side of vegetation, um, then you kind of, you can base that upon the 3% consumption of, you know, whether it's uh, sheep, goats, cattle across the board. Now cattle, you know, those numbers are just a little bit different, but you can, st it's still flexible enough that you can use those same numbers. So as the goats were coming in, I had them run in front. They would, they would eat high. Uh, and then the, the uh, cattle would come in, um, you know, the next week. So a barber pole worm that, you know, is shedding eggs, that egg, by the time it's an L3 stage, it's already climbing up the moisture line. Mm -hmm. So as it's climbing up the moisture line, those cattle can come in and they can actually eat those worms, those, those eggs, and destroy them in their in their room. So tell people about that. Uh, some people think that you know a ruminant's a ruminant, and if a barber pole worm is going to take down a sheep, it'll also affect a cow. Not so much. No, no. Um, so the digestive system of a cow, they're able to uh, kill those particular barber pole worms. Now there are worms that they do share, and that's what you have to be careful of. Sure. Um, however, they're in my opinion, they're easier to kill. Yes. Um, with, uh, you know, with your different type warmers. Right. I think, I think across the board, if you're going to have sheep and goats in the United States, the number one problem you're going to tackle is barber pole worms yes. as, as far as parasites are concerned. So we've got the cattle, we've got the transition eventually into sheep and essentially you're still running it the same way that you're running the sheep first and then the cows come in behind. But that can change up depending on the season, right? Because yes. depending on the protein level on the pastures, you may actually have to switch things up. Right, and that's what we'll do. So uh, last year we did have some problems um, where the sheep were just, uh, there's too much protein out here. They were running in front um, of the cattle and uh, you know we were having all kinds of problems basically. There, I had different nutritionalists. I had one come out to the farm and right out of the gate he said it's too much, too much protein. And that was a hard pill for me to swallow. I, I could not understand and wrap my head around that. We took that to heart and we changed it up. So August last year, we switched it up and put the cows in front to, to help knock down all the clover that we had in the paddocks and to kind of help regulate some of those uh, protein levels. Um, so this year, we will probably modify our program just a little bit more. So we were rotating every two days. And so that clips the top of, you know, of the grass, the highest amount of energy, and that still has a strike against you if you still have too much protein. Sure. So more than likely, I'll kind of fall back a little bit to how we were managing things with the, uh, with the goats, managed from a worm perspective, but in, in reality, it's also a protein twist to where, you know, grazers will tell you don't graze your paddock more, or don't graze them down less than three inches. Sure. Um, Keep Which I completely understand. It keeps them out of the dirt. But I think in, in reality, I think you can go probably further. Obviously, you don't want to go to the dirt. Right. However, you want to stay in that 14% ideal protein level right. if you could. Right. So, and that's, you know, the, the, the question that everybody asks, well, how often do you rotate? And the, the standard answer is it depends. Yeah. I, the number one question I get, uh, not the number one, one of the number one questions I get how long can I keep them on a paddock? How long, uh, how much land do I need for this specific number of animals? You know, and, and I don't want to be rude, but at the same time, and, but here's the problem. The problem is, is there's plenty of people out there that'll just tell them, they'll be like, right. whatever you want to hear, you know, I'll tell you exactly how many animals you got to have. They don't ask them where they're from, what kind of rainfall, what kind of ground, what kind of, there's so many things you just have to, look at it you yes. got to be out there and you got to look at it and you walk out there one day and you'll say yep they need to move today yeah and then you move them and or once you get the hang of it as i'm sure you're like us we'll look at it my wife and i'll talk and i'll be like we're gonna have to move them in about two days you know or we're gonna have to move them in about three days whatever you just look at it and you know 
Right. So, and you can see what the temps are like, you know what time of the year it is, but it takes time. And so maybe for the first year or so or two, you might have to go out there every day. You should be going out there every day anyways, but, right, right. but you might have to go out there every day and look at it um, or maybe take notes if you can't take mental notes and, and remember. And, and we still get caught up sometimes. It happens to us and I assume it happens to you to where I'll be like, they can do two more days on that. And then I go out the next morning and I'm like, Ooh. oh damn, <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah, yeah, guess Wait not, yeah. 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 So so it's not an exact science, but it gets better. It does, and it's hard, um, it, you know, from a new person coming in. So I've had, and I'm sure just like you, I've had multiple conversations. Hey, I've got 20 acres, but I want a miniature of what you have. How do I set that up? Right. Well, that's a lot. You know, that's still a big that's, ask. That's a long conversation. It, it is. It is. And then, you know, that person, that newbie will get overwhelmed. Yes. Because I've been there too. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like I'll, I'll struggle on, on this this side. And, and you know, I, I've compared grazing as an art. It, it really is an art. And you learn something every single year. Right. It's not just, you know, somebody who says they've got it all figured out, I, I'd, I'd caution Right. Just because there's too many variables. Right. Everything changes. Simple answers to complex problems is never good. <laughs> right, right, exactly. And and I think exposing yourself to different exposing yourself to different ideas and it's it's difficult. Yes. Uh, and and even so it's difficult on two fronts. It's difficult to communicate that to different people because you don't want to run up to someone and be like, Tim, you, you've been doing it wrong the whole time <laughs> because immediately people are like, Oh boy. Right. Um but at the same time, you have to develop a little bit of modesty, I think, to be successful to your own detriment if you don't. Because uh, as you and I have talked, man, every time I go to a farm, uh, every time somebody has something new. You know, right. we came here and talked with you. I got the auger for my corn <laughs> and uh, the uh, Mix 30. Yep. Uh, had no idea about either one of them. And ev it never fails. Every yeah. place I go, someone's got something that they can share. And if you shut yourself down to that, yes. you're just hurting yourself. Of course, on the flip side, we have to be good consumers of, uh, uh, of information too. Huh. And I guess it can be difficult to wade through some of the stuff because there are people that have no problem telling you what to do and they have no idea what they're doing. Right. So it's, it's, it's tough. It's a complex problem. It, it is. It, it really is. And you know, from from a you know selling livestock to somebody, I've always I've always told people, you know, don't hesitate to reach out. Right. Yes, if you're going to own animals, you're going to have dead animals too. Yes. Um, if you're going to yeah. have livestock, you're going to have dead stock. Yes. It, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and there's a learning curve. You know, back in the goat days, you know, I would flat out tell people, and I probably scared some people off, right. saying. This is a hard learning curve. Yes. Goats, you can look at them cross-eyed and they will fall over dead immediately. Yes. Yes. Um, you know, sheep are a little bit better. However, you put them in some of those situations, they'll drop dead in a heartbeat. Yeah. And I, I am a fan of, uh, I have a friend that's in a uh, very Southern United States uh, uh, right now and they deal with their worms and coccidia issues are huge down there because it's he's basically almost in a tropical environment. Yeah. He's down on the Gulf. And I have been telling him, and I believe this is, if there was someone in this area that told me if they were like, I want to get into sheep and I want to raise them on rotational grazing, whatever, I would send them to you. I think the closer you can get to what you want, coming off of a good farm, the better off you're going to be. I, Absolutely. I, you know, I think if you're bringing them in from Texas to here in Indiana, I think it's even more of a learning curve. They're used to a different yes. environment. They're used to different parasites, whatever. So I'm a big fan of find somebody successful as close to you as possible and, and go that route. Um, we've and been I think, down that road. Yeah. You know, we've brought some stock in here from, you know, uh, on the other side of the Mississippi. Right. You know, uh, you know, my family has land and, and a farm out there and it's completely different. Sure. You know, I, I could, I brought them over here and they completely fell apart. Right. And it's very interesting because even sometimes geographically, it doesn't seem that much different. You know, right. the difference between Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, Missouri, Kentucky, 
it doesn't seem that much different, but boy, when you're pulling livestock from one place to another, it's amazing to me how big of a difference there is. That's huge. So I think that's a, a valuable aspect for people thinking about getting into this too, is if you live in an area where maybe there aren't a lot of, of reliable breeders, this could really be a good opportunity for you to get started and maybe open up a business to where you're selling breeding stock to other other people um we're kind of at a deficit in parts of indiana it's just like a dead zone uh because we have such a high club lamb uh high amount of club lambs right. when you're looking at hair sheep it's it's picking up but it's nowhere near some other areas right. so i guess that's a good segue to your livestock do you sell right off the farm? How what do what do sales look like? So if somebody's watching this video and they're like, I want to buy from that guy. Uh, obviously, we're going to have your contact information in the description below. But what does that look like? Do you people just come on the farm, pick them out, and go? Or so in the past, we have kind of done that, and it, it tends to be difficult because they're not by the barn. You can't just up and say, Oh yeah, stop by and and pick up a, right. a lamb or two. Right. Um, so this year, what we're going to do we've kind of mapped out a very uh, definitive schedule sequence of events that happens in our farm. So since we, we try to hit that December market, we, we'll ship the first or second weekend in December um, that goes to wholesale, uh, the wholesale market. But so what we're gonna do this year is uh, the first weekend in November. Um, so if somebody says, you know, calls me up and says, hey, you know, interested in some livestock, they can send me a deposit. So that way they're guaranteed to pick out from something, you know, that we deem is gonna be good breeding stock. And then come November, the first weekend in November, we're gonna have a, a basically a, a weekend sale um, where they can, the, the folks that have either um, given us a deposit or want to show up and, and take a look at it, uh, they've got that opportunity. Um, you know, we're, I think we're going to call it lamb stock this year, just kind of a, a you know, cute little name to, right. to try to get that opportunity out there um, so people can actually see the group as a whole, you know, in overall. And the other, the other nice thing is, is for individuals that are wanting to do this, they can come out, they can see how they're raised, where they're at, and so they know what they're getting. It's not so much of a, of, of a huge change uh, from one area to another. I guess sometimes people come to our farm and they pick out the biggest wool sheep they see and they're like, that looks fantastic. I'm going to take that home and rotational graze that. I'm like, no, you're not. It's gonna work. I'm like, no, you're not. And and so you, you have to have that conversation with your uh, customers for sure. Where are you at price-wise for use? Uh, do you have a price in mind for breeding use? Uh, the way I try to gauge pricing is I want that person to make money right. the second year. Right. You know, because cows, it's two and a half years. So usually it's anywhere from three to four hundred dollars okay. that I'm looking You're at. You're right where you so, should be. Right. Yeah. Something that's that's attainable. Right. It's not astronomical. You know, um, a lot of work has gone into that. I don't want to just give away my genetics and my work. Sure. You know. Well, you spend a lot of time to get them. You'll, you spend a lot of time to get them where they need to be. Yes. And it's a lot of culling and, you know, it, it's a lot. It's, it it's more than just having a baby and selling it. it exactly. And, you know, kind of going back to your point, um, as far as taking, you know, taking the biggest, you know, lamb off of your place. Right. And, and so the, the actual, the reverse actually happens here. Um, people might get discouraged when they come here because ours don't look grain fed. Ours don't look fat and dumpy. They're not club lambs, yeah. That's... Exactly. Right. Um, but um, an interesting event that's kind of happened and taken place, like from the goat world. So this is the same way that I raise my goats. And so when we were in the registered game, um, everybody, so we, we sold out. And, well, let me back up. Prior to that, I got out of the registered game because we had so many. Um, However, a lot of the folks that had my genetics, so they go to the Maryland test, they go to all these different buck tests, and if it has my name in the lineage, they're always in the top 10% on efficiencies. Oh, okay. So, having said that, you're gonna have the same thing, because I was geared towards you know, commercial, low input, same type of philosophy I've got with the sheep. Right. But now these folks are basically taking my genetics, right. pushing the grain to them, right. and they have the highest efficiencies Very across good. the board. So 
you know, kind of like what we were discussing before, if you took one of these and if you wanted to go through and show them or put them in an environment that's not like this, right, um, where it was more of a feedlot situation, they would excel like crazy. Sure. Um, you know, kind of the flip side. To me, the way, and I could be wrong, but to me, we put them through the riggers out here. It is, it's tough. Right. We don't babysit them. Right. You make it or you don't. Exactly. Right. And, and if you have that genetic and that thought philosophy, really, they could probably thrive in about anywhere. You gotcha. Know, in, the, in the Midwest, in my opinion. Sure. So these guys are here on the grain today. Boy, the dogs are just having a They're time of their life, is. aren't they? <laughs> uh, do you have some sheep over in the neighbor's property? Yes, we do. Okay. We've already got them over there. And those are the ones that uh, we're going to load up. Okay, so they're supposed to be there. No. Okay. <laughs> they're not supposed to be there. They are the group that always gets out. Really? You could have a pile of green over here, and they'll go over there. Yeah. Yeah, we have a few of those, don't we, Lindy? They're like, I want to go where you don't want me to go. Yeah, I give yeah. Lauren a hard time because, so that colored one. Uh-huh. <laughs> see, I keep giving her a hard time because you see how defensive she got all of a sudden. Right. I'm like your your goats are out again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so these guys will just eat this down over a couple of days. They're picking through the corn now. Some of them, some of them are just doing their own thing. Yes. Uh, which is normal. That's what they do, right? Right. And then in a couple of days, the cows will come in behind them. So. The Mix 30, do you put any Mix 30 in with them? Yes, so uh, typically what we'll do, so we've got so we've got the the main feed stuff in here. Mm -hmm. So the next thing to do is we'll pull the mineral in here. Okay. And then we'll also put the Mix 30 in here for them. Okay, let's do it. All right. All right. When do you can... Definitely beats having to scoop it out of the top, huh? Yes. Yeah. Climbing up there, yes. Right. Plus, the nice thing is, too, you can keep it like ours. We had cut the top off. Where this one, you don't have to. You can just keep it weather tight. Exactly. Exactly. Do you get much condensation in there or no? Um, it's not bad. Okay. Not enough to cause the problem. Nope. How much corn do you guys go through? So, this year is the first year we've really started feeding more corn. Uh -huh. um, so we this is this is in this winter. So okay. this whole thing is so what is that about 12, 15 bushels? Right. Um, so that's about all we've gone through this winter. So we don't feed a lot, but right. uh, there's you know, times where you have to. Right, exactly. Exactly. Try not to if you uh, can help it. Right. <laughs> well in you know we're right in that time of year too again like kind of like we discussed before. It's harder to keep them in because they want that green grass. You got to give them an incentive to stay right. um, and to follow you. Right. Um, and then, you know, we're halfway through gestation, March, or I'm sorry, May 1st, we start lambing. They're starting to gain weight. They're starting to need that extra energy. Yeah, as I, as I look out into the pasture, a lot of green. Yes. And then this week they're saying 70 degrees. Right. So that'll definitely give things a boost. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Perspective, this time of year is probably the hardest. Right. Um, on the livestock, just because, and we've lost a few, um, a few of the younger ones, just because of those extreme temperatures. Sure. Um, you know, pneumonia sets in really quick. You know, as soon as it does, um, right. th they fall off the cliff real quick. They get that chill at night too, right. so they're nice and warm all day, and then they get cold at night, and right. it's still damp. All right, so then we'll get some chocolate milk for them. Okay, so this is the Mix 30. This is Mix 30. 16% uh, protein. What did we say on the, on the, it was 10%, 10% fat, is it? Fat. Yeah. Yes. So it's, it is not a urea based source. So it is a, Correct. and I like the consistency of it and we're getting ready to get some on our farm. I've, I've reached awesome. out. I've reached out to the sales guy in my area. I like the consistency of it. Currently, we mix in molasses in our feed. It's a little too thick. Yeah. Um, and with cracked corn, it's it's just a little bit too much. Right. Um, and then you end up just getting little corn, little molasses corn balls. Yes. So I'm pretty excited about this. 
That's awesome. Yeah. I reached out to their marketing department, and they're not interested in even returning my my email, so. Really? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It comes around. Business must be good. Business must be really, really good. <laughs> so, so they'll get their feelings hurt when I make the video. Right. I'm like, I tried to contact him, but they won't return my call. But the sales guy uh, that I spoke to, my local sales guy, was very nice. Uh, very yeah. upfront about costs and how they figure things. And nice. Like he told me, he's like... He's like, a lot of it's depending on how close you are to the to the supplier. He's like, because I got to pay the guy to truck it out. He said, now, if you have your own trucks and stuff to where he, but he said he's just not there. He right. said, you know, if he had his own truck and he could go get it with his own tanks, he said, then you can really make some good money. But he said he's at the point now where he's having to pay someone to bring it out to his farm. Right. And we looked at the numbers as far as like, okay, if I drive to get it cheaper, because I can drive mm -hmm. to get it cheaper, but then it was like. It's not cost effective. It doesn't, it doesn't. And. I think for him, a dollar sixty. I think was what he was wanting. I can't remember. I think that's what you said. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was like, eh, it's not ideal, but it is what it is. It's still way cheaper than. I mean, it's way more cost it's, effective than right, anything right. else I can even come close to. And I like the fact too that it's it's fat based. Um, they're not going to get you know the scours or anything like right. that from it. If right. they overeat, they're not. Go they're really not going to overeat. Um, the thing I wish was a little bit different, and I don't know if it just might be my farm, I don't know, but so um, there are times when you would think that they should be eating it. You know, if those temperatures do drop off a cliff or something, um, and it might be just the time of year and where the grass is as well, that, you know, you would wish that they would eat a, eat a little bit more just to help maintain, but they're too busy eating on the empty grass, you know, so. Right. So from a palatability standpoint, they probably don't love it, right. but, but it, it fits the bill when needed. I suppose if you were mixing feed and you were incorporating in your feed, it might be a little bit easier to push on them. Yeah, the yeah. cattle guys, they'll, they'll mix it in with their feed. How long have you been using it? So I've been using it off and on probably for the last, I don't know, eight years. Oh, wow. Um, how, are, how is it with flies is, was the question I wanted to get to. I had no issues with flies. Um, they don't. They don't seem to mess with it. Really, when I was when you rotate the cows in with the you know in the mix like we do, if there's anything left over, the cows will lick the paint off the, the you know just to get to it. Okay. So they do a good job of cleaning up. But we have left it out. Um, I've also you know left it out to where there's this much rain on top of it. Where the sheep, the small rumen, eh, they're not. They're a little more apprehensive. The cows, they'll come in and tear it up. They don't care. So, so generally speaking, the cows like it more than the yes, sheep? Okay. absolutely. So if you put it in front of the cows, they're going to... It's gone. It, oh, wow. They'll fight you over it. Really? Yes. Huh. At least mine will. Isn't that interesting? It is. It, it really is. Um, I don't know what the difference is if, you know... So, yeah, so I'm running cattle with my sheep, so I'll probably have to... Do you have any preference when you're unrolling as far as wind direction or the way you roll it north or south, or does it matter? So it really doesn't matter. There is one little key, and I always mess it up. But however the bale is spun, if you can unroll it you know, backwards from the way it was spun, it'll unroll better. Is there a way to tell by looking at the net wrapping? Um, they, not, not by the net itself, but actually by I saw, I can't remember who it was, but they said if you go up here and kind of put your hand on it and, and rub across it, if it's smooth like fur, uh, that's the way to go with the fur, basically, versus the other way would be... Rough in your rough, stick. It. Yeah, right, that, makes, right. that, that so, makes sense because the way it laid in. Right, right. All right. So this one, I think I've got it in the right direction, uh, but it's not, a, it's not a deal breaker. The other way, if you do it the other way, um, sometimes it's actually better depending upon what your purposes are. Meaning, if you want to stretch that bale out a very long way, just drop a little bit at a time, that works out real well too. So it kind of depends on, you know, your goals, I guess. 
uh, with me, I don't pay attention to it. I just pick it up and roll. So you're unrolling two bales today, and that will that will cover about how many sheep? How many are we looking at? So we're looking at about 200 sheep. Okay. Uh, roughly 200 head, and. Um, so what I'll probably end up doing in addition to, because of the time of year, you know, we, we talked about the time of year, they want the grass. Um, I have to watch because they'll try to get out to the neighbors or the different paddocks. Um, so, you know, the old saying, it's not feed until you touch it, right? right. So um, we'll unroll this, um, but I'm gonna come back and drop a bale, a full bale. So, you know, they don't have to work so hard to go after what's on the ground. Gotcha. So, and it's kind of a, it works this time of year, it, it's a lot harder uh, to get them to concentrate on the fresh stuff on the ground. We take advantage of the fact that we know that they're gonna bet on it. So we'll, and it's not so far in the growing season that it's gonna hinder any growth. So we still wanna take advantage of the cold temperatures, still unroll, still concentrate that manure. Uh, but we also don't want them getting out to the neighbor's house. Uh, so that's why we kind of leave that extra bale out there. Do you run into a time of year where rolling this down on the ground could hurt the growth? Yes. So, and that's a, and that's a hard one to hit. Um, but uh, typically, like if you were, I would say by April, uh, definitely, by, definitely by April, if you unroll on top of the green grass, you'll just kill it. And it'll sit there, it'll try, the grass will try to will kind of the existing grass will kind of make that barrier, and it won't um, be absorbed into the ground as fast. So you'll have this nice streak in the middle of your pasture where it didn't get, you know, composted into the ground. Gotcha. So we're saying they average about a hundred head will burn through a bale in in two days. Right. So depending upon your bale size and your calculations. So, you know, with everything, there's a calculation to this. Sure. You're looking at their body weight, you know, 100 to 120 pounds, depending upon your livestock, you know, I'm probably closer to 120 pounds-ish. Some of them are bigger. So you're looking at 3% of their body weight, you know, multiply that out per day. I got 800 to 900 pound bales. So you kind of figure that, you know, one bale per day per 200 head, roughly that should sustain them and then what <clears throat> what we do after that is once the sheep come onto this bale or this field with the fresh bale we'll move these cows to where the sheep were and the sheep are more picky than the cows are so the the cows will come in and they'll pick up what the sheep left behind and i'll, I'll also give them one bale so there's roughly a hundred head ish worth of cow weight in my cattle herd. So therefore they're picking up the, the uh, whatever was left over and then they're also getting a little bit fresh as well just to kind of make that buffer. Gotcha. And about how, how much weight is one of these bales? So this, uh, he weighed these last year, I think they're around 100, or I'm sorry, 850 pounds. And you'll lose a little as they dry, but not much. Yeah, not much. If it's good bait, if it's good A when you get it, right, it right. shouldn't lose a whole lot. Exactly. Gotcha. I haven't weighed them dry, you know, when we go to feed, but I know, you know, his wet bales, his fresh bales, you know, they're pushing 900 pounds. So, uh, and he packs them really tight. On some of the bales, you, you'll be able to tell. So when we unroll it, sometimes they just, even if you have it situated correctly, they just won't unpack. And so the faster you drive, the more it'll try to fall apart. On times when you have, so where I live, we have lots of wind all the time. Do you have issues with wind? If, if it's real windy, will it just pick this stuff up and take it away? Um, so it hasn't, we haven't been in that situation yet. We are rolling hills. There are areas where we can kind of get tucked away from, from some of that wind. I don't think we have near the wind that you guys do. Um, but we have seen it, and we may see it today, where a gust will come along and it'll just roll them. It'll, it'll kind of make like a wave. You know, it, where that strip that's unrolled, it'll just peel it and go this way. To me, it's not that big of a deal because eventually with the temperatures, with them, they'll pack it in, they'll, they'll still pick through it. Now, do you get a lot of snow here? 
Um, so it varies from year to year, but typically not not near as much as you guys do. Do you know how this would work for our viewers that are in climates where maybe they get a couple feet of snow? That's one thing I never see them talk about online for the guys that do this big time, and this is what they push. What happens when you live in Minnesota and you get two feet of snow, or do you really know the answer to that? So I don't really know the answer to that, but I can tell you what we have experienced. So we've had situations where we've had about a foot of snow. You know, comparatively speaking, it's not near as bad as two, three, four foot. Um, what we found out, so typically, if I know a snowstorm's coming in, I won't feed until that snowstorm hits. As soon as it hits, and we're pretty well, you know, the majority of the snow's done, I'll come out here and roll directly right on top of that snow. Um, usually that's the best utilization by the animals because it's real fresh, you know. They, and it also supplies them a place to bed. Um, that, to me, that was huge. Um, last year, I don't know if you remember last year, I think it was about, I think it might have been January or so, it got down. Of course, this year it got really bad too, but we had that really steep drop off. Right. Um, it just so happened that same weekend I had three calves born. Of course. Yeah. Right? They're in a paddock over there. They were out of the wind. However, we had about a foot of snow. Um, so fortunately, one was born during the snowstorm um, and the others were mid process. So I got out there real quick. We unrolled, actually I rolled, unrolled extra hay for him at that time. And if you can pro provide a place off that snow for those babies, you're golden. You get them out of the wind, sure. get them on a, you know, off that ice and everything, uh, and we didn't have any problems. So it's not a problem, it, uh, it still unrolls fairly it's well? It still unrolls, yep. Okay. So uh, we have, I have experience to where um, we did have one situation where it just wouldn't unroll. The, the snow will stack up, it acts as a plow. Oh, sure. Uh, so, you kind of have to bounce it a little bit along and gotcha. it'll start to unroll. So the yeah. same, I, this is basically the same principle as a sod roller, right? It's it, it's gonna pinch the bale um, right. with hydraulic pressure, just pinches it. Right. Now for individuals that don't have a tractor, you can buy a bale and roller as well. Yeah, we have one of those that you can pull behind your UTV or even ATV. Um, it works great. Uh, we've had situations where, so if you kind of notice, I've placed a bunch of bales all out through throughout the different fields, so it kind of preloads the the uh, the paddocks just in case something happens. We have a you know something breaks down, uh, one of us gets sick, something like that. Uh, we had a situation where I was gone for an extended period of time. I'd spend the day coming out here and put everything out here for Lauren and to keep her off the tractor. You know, from a safety perspective, <clears throat> she would take that trailer, that bale trailer. And she could do everything. Um, you know, she's only 90 pounds sopping wet. So, and she was able to, to crank it up, lift it, move them to another paddock, whatever she needed to do, she could do. Do you have a preference as to which one you feel unrolls better or? So convenience wise, I like the tractor because it, you know, pneumatics and everything like that, it's easier uh, with the trailer. Uh, the advantage to the trailer, it's a little bit more effort, a little bit more work. However, you're a lot lighter on your paddocks, on your ground. So if, you're, if, if you've had a big rain, it's been you know, raining forever, or you have flat ground um, and it's not drying out, you know, you're at 4,000, 5,000 plus pounds with your tractor versus your UTV and your bale, you're half of that. Easy. Sure. So, you know, and we've had situations too where it was muddy, so we put it out with the UTV. Got a little nervous because it was so muddy. You know, we we haven't been completely stuck, right. you know, but four wheel drive and hit the gas pretty hard and drive it like you stole it, it sure. unrolls pretty good. All right, well, we're gonna step back and watch you unroll it. Okay, sounds great.
deal. So what's up next? We are gonna right. we're gonna maneuver these. Yeah. So we're gonna walk up here and we're gonna Ooh, rotate you know, them into the new paddock and we'll walk them up. Okay. And uh, we'll take them up and they're they they already know what's gonna happen here. So um, and they'll have access to the to the uh, bales that we just unrolled. Okay. Sounds good. your sheep here all what? right so uh, uh, these are Katahdin and Katahdin crosses uh, there's roughly 200 in here so we have uh, a few of last year's lambs that we uh, held back we culled pretty hard overall we do have several different rams in here we do have one ram that we really like as far as and he is registered Katahdin from our culling aspect you know we're looking at uh, hair we're looking at mothering abilities milk production we want, we want an animal that's not gonna fall apart, uh, you know, as soon as she has lambs and she puts all of her effort into those, into the milk. Sure. Uh, raising off the, the bigger lambs. Our perspective might be a little bit different than others from the respect of the market that we're shooting for is in December. So we have all year long to get, to get those gains. Uh, a lot of folks, you know, uh, including yourself too, I, I believe you'll lamb out early push the grain to them, try to hit the Easter market, and then you're done. Right. Um, and, and I get that, a lot of people uh, do that. We kind of have a little bit of a different uh, uh, spin. You know, we're lambing in May, the first of May, and we don't necessarily, we just want healthy lambs. We don't necessarily care that they get a massive growth right out of the gate because we want 40 to 60 pound lambs by the first of December. So you got more time to work with. Yes. Less inputs. Less input. Uh, the disadvantage is the liability. Sure. They're on our property longer. Our worm loads grow uh, uh, from paddock to paddock. We do lose some just from that 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 parasite load. Sure. Um, but I think that kind of keys into a lot of attributes that folks look for in breeding stock. They want to see uh, steady growth rates. They want to see a you know parasite resistance overall healthy moms that can raise off uh, you know a good lamb no i agree so you've got you've got some dorper crosses in here looks like i see some black see some black heads yes all yeah. right have you noticed much of a benefit from incorporating the dorper what are your thoughts on what's your favorite so, have, and have you tried anything that you're like now nah, just in, ain't for me so uh this year is probably the first year that we will see the dorper influence we kind of scaled back pretty heavily. So throughout all of last year, we had the opportunity to buy out a couple other herds. Uh, one herd you can see has that Dorper uh, influence. Um, another herd, very similar from the way we graze, the, the rotational grazing. They're used to you know how basically we kind of handle everything. Um, so it was good. It was a good opportunity. So this year we're, we're really excited. We're anxious to see what that does to these lambs. So the the rams that we have in here, so this ram right here is more of a St. Croix influence. Mm -hmm. um, I don't necessarily like that St. Croix influence other than the parasites. Yes, um, I agree. Uh, everything else I don't necessarily like about them just because, you know, they kind of look like a goat. They're very skinny. Uh, the dorper, to your point, they're wider in the chest. Uh, wider in the rump. With the ram that we have, again, we're really looking forward to seeing just what changes we can see in some of these lambs. From a breeding stock perspective, uh, I do plan on trying to hold back several. Uh, we'll probably put them in a test of sorts 
uh, into, into their own separate paddock um, so we can kind of test them for parasite resistance as well. Market wise, in my eyes, the butcher's looking at, they want to see a block, you know, right. a nice- They're looking at the nice final product. Block. Exactly. Sure. Um, and that's kind of where I'm looking, you know, I, I want to be at that end product, but I also want to have the genetics to be able to get there with, you know, the mothering. Um, the milk production, the parasites, and things like right. that. And again, it's all it's all what works for you, your yes. property, your climate, everything else. You know, when you look at it, you and I live in very similar climates. Uh, we both live in the same state. We raise different breeds for different markets at different times of the year, and we raise our animals completely different because. Right. We have to, because right. what works for me, I'm breeding at different times of the year than you are. So I have different stressors than you do. You have different stressors than I do. You know, they both have good points. They both have bad points. Uh, I, if I took my sheep and, and put them in here, they'd all die. Um, <laughs> they'd all get worms and die. Yeah. Uh, for the most part, we have a few Katahdins, but if I put my wool sheep in here, yeah, they'd all get worms and die. And if you took some of yours to mine and, and they got fed the grain the way that I feed mine grain, they would probably get really sick and right. bloat up and and not and be die. very attractive and, dry, <laughs> and die so again you know and that's the point that uh, that we try to get across to people is there is no there is no magic bullet yeah. there is no secret weapon and it takes time it does it, it, it takes years right? honestly and nobody likes to hear that right. but it does it takes years and it takes mistakes yes. you try to learn as much as you can from other people's mistakes but at the same time your situation is so unique that it's like, okay, I'm not doing that again. Right. Or that worked and I'm going to stick with that. So yeah, I get it. It, it. It's a process. And I think we had talked about it before too, even with developing that eye to tell when an animal's not feeling well, yes. uh, the, the better you get at that. And that just comes with time it and, does. and it comes with spending time with your animals. I'm amazed at how friendly they are. So, so these two are actually, they're not bottle babies, but they're Lauren's babies. So this is a trick. Th yes. <laughs> so, so this is Cupid. He's a he's a superstar. He's a, he's these been on siblings. film before. Yeah. These are these are siblings. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, they turned three like a few days ago. Okay. Yeah. So uh, yeah, he's been on camera before. We had a church group come out and they wanted to shoot some pictures of. Uh, did you show for, this guy before, or did you do 4 A training? No. Huh? Okay. So he's just he's just fun. He's just friendly. Yeah. He's a weather. Yeah. Yes. Wow. So, wow. <laughs> so so yeah. he's he's really just here, just just yes. just to get just enjoying just life. Get yep. So and this this one right here is kind of funny too. So you know, with names you just however. So right. I always called her friendly. So because out of the blue she decided she's just going to be friendly. Right. We have a friendly, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. So. Barbara and Barbara Jr. <laughs> I see. So there's a common denominator here with, with the, yes. okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it is, it is, it makes it more enjoyable to have ones that like to be around you that you can handle. Yeah. Not to say that it's not enjoyable without it, but I think there's an element to raising livestock that you completely miss out on if you don't have a few that are just there for fun. Right. And right. we have a few that are just there for fun. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No one would want to buy them even if we had them for sale, but <laughs> but that's a, that's okay. So you do have some livestock guardian dogs in here, I noticed. Yes. And it looks like a couple different breeds, or what do we got? Right, yep. So we've got two Anatolian Shepherds, and then we've got uh, uh, Greek Pyrenees. Uh, so the, the, the Anatolian Shepherds, they're a lot younger than this one here. She, um, she's kind of like the mom of the farm. Okay, um, how old is she? Uh, she's, what would you say, Lauren? She's probably close to eight or nine. Yeah, she's old. She's she's pretty old. So for uh, so yeah, wow. For a Pyrenees, so for a Pyrenees, she's like a hundred. Yes, exactly. That's why we call her kind of good for her. her mom. Yep. So, um, but and then these two here, they're younger. I think they're about three. Uh, yeah, they're three or four. Yeah, three three to four. I have no experience with this breed at all. So and and so I have, 
I've had experience with Commodores, which I'll never do again. Okay. Uh, murderously aggressive. They would be great for if I was worried about bears or yeah. something like that. I think I might consider them. Yeah. But too much for uh, for us or what we have. And then we've got our new. Uh, we've got our uh, Great Pyrenees. But I don't. I hear a lot about these, but I don't know much about them. So, these two specifically. So, so the Anatolian Shepherd. And you'll have to forgive me. I don't understand the whole um, registration between the Kangles and the Anatolian Shepherd, but they're the same dog. Right. Uh, I think there was a split in the, you know, in the registries. So it was kind of dumb luck. Their parents came right off the boat. Um, they were the first first line, first lineage over here in the U.S. Uh, from a Kangle. And where does that breed from? Turkey, that's right. And, and their parents from Turkey. I always describe them, everybody kind of asks, well, you know, what's your description of them? And I always say they're Ferrari brains and, pra and paper brakes. Um, they, they are extremely intense. There are times we have to slow them down, you know, from that, that curiosity to go see what that lamb is to a, an immediate chase because the lamb is scared of the dog. It becomes predator prey. And that's something that you, you really have to watch out, at least from my experience with these. In hindsight, n knowing what you know now, would you still choose this breed for your specific setup? We gotta be careful because people people will get angry. Right. You know, people get a, I, I've got a full standard poodle. I think it's the best dog ever. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, some people may not agree with that. That's okay. So I, in my opinion, if these if these girls were crossbred with a good Pyrenees, mm -hmm. I, honestly, I think that would be probably a good fit. Okay. Um, because the problem, you know, the historical problem with me and Pyrenees is they like to wander. Yes. Um, these girls will wander too. However, it's just not quite as bad that we've seen. However, they do get a wild hair and they'll try to explore here and there. I've always kind of thought, you know, from an, maybe an experiment perspective, you know, a cross between the Pyrenees and these guys, just to maybe slow, slow them down a little bit, kind of that relaxed energy. I think no matter what breed you get into, they all have, have their, a, yeah, they, yeah, they all have their little quirks. Yeah. Um, their dogs are going to be dogs, right? Um, no matter how good your fence is mm -hmm. in some respects. Yes. So we really like our great Pyrenees, mm -hmm. but the female that we have wants to wander. Yeah. And the male will sometimes just drag along with her because he's yep. like, well, where are we going? This must be fun. Yeah. Do your buyers care about color? I mean, I suppose so, when you get people coming out to buy, right? Right. So typically color sells. Not everybody will appreciate a full, you know, all white sheep. Right. Um, and that's kind of what we've done to our ram. Uh, we, uh, we call him Murphy. I'm not sure. So he's up here in the middle. You can kind of see he's br that tan, tan and white. Yes, it's, uh, I know there's a magic term for that color and I can't think of it. Yeah, um, he throws a lot of color. That was kind of one of the other attributes that we really liked about him. Well, then um, you got a polka dot one over here. Right, so. I've yeah. never seen that in a sheep, that's very cool. Yep, so, and that came from another farm, some other, some real nice folks uh, down uh, uh, towards um, Clarksville area. They raised a lot of 4-H stuff. So, and, and how we kind of started out too is, you know, Lauren, we had a bunch of goats. Uh, about a hundred head of goats and Lauren kept bugging me about having sheep and she did a research paper for school and all this kind of stuff on it so um, so she would raise the bottle babies and she took that money and bought herself some sheep and she kept saying dad this is the way we need to go and of course you know how it is you already you have so much invested sure uh, in goats and another breed and everything uh, especially with the Kiko goats that we had I was kind of reluctant she went through what the, her first lambing and after that, I was pretty well sold. Um, I, I couldn't believe how well they did. Uh, they, you know, they didn't need any babysitting whatsoever. Um, so then I turned around and bought some because I told her, I said, I wanted to try and test them, but I didn't want to end up, you know, killing hers. So I bought some, tested them out, kind of put them through the ringer uh, from a, you know, in a comparison, you know, ap apples to apples in, apples and apples to livestock, but from a setting perspective, sure, they performed much better uh, overall. They're much more efficient than a goat ever will be, uh, you know, as far as whether it's a feed conversion or even from a kidding perspective, uh, how much, how much, how much, how much, how much. That's been kind of sold